Cambridge IGCSE Chemistry Major 2020 Paper 62 Question 1. Hot copper 2 oxide reacts with hydrogen, the products are copper and steam. The apparatus used to react copper 2 oxide with hydrogen is shown. We have copper 2 oxide, hydrogen as the reactants, and these should be the products. Part A. Draw an arrow on the diagram to show where the apparatus should be heated. Well, it didn't mention that they're going to heat it, but since they said the product was a steam, we can just assume that it's going to be heated. So if you want to heat it, obviously you will have to heat it where the reactants are. So I'll draw it over here, right below copper 2 oxide. Part B. During the reaction, the color of the copper 2 oxide changes. State the color change. Okay, the products are copper and steam. Well, you can see that there's no copper to be found around this area, so the copper will just stay here. And from this, we can know that it's going to change from copper to oxide to copper. Well, the color of copper to oxide is black, and the color of copper is brown. So it's from black to brown. Part C. Identify the colorless liquid collected. It's the one over here. Well, if you react copper to oxide with hydrogen, you will get copper and steam. Notice that it's hydrogen, H2, and oxide, so obviously there's something related to oxygen. While well, if you have H2 and oxide oxygen, you get water. So basically, this liquid is water. Part D. Explain why the U-tube is in ice. This is the U-tube, and it's in ice. Well, they told us that steam is going to be produced and it's easier to store in a liquid state instead of a gas state. So it's to condense the steam and change it to liquid. Part E. Large amounts of unreacted hydrogen should not be allowed to escape into the laboratory. State why. Hydrogen is famous for being a very flammable substance. It can explode easily if there's just a little bit of heat, so it's because it's flammable. Complete the diagram to show how the unreacted hydrogen could be collected and its volume measured. Label any apparatus that you draw. So this whole thing is actually taken from this section of the diagram. And they just left it here that unreacted hydrogen will go in that way. So we are supposed to draw an apparatus so that it can be collected and its volume measured. Well, one way is to draw a gas jar. This is a gas jar. And since it needs to be measured, you can replace the gas jar with a measuring cylinder. But this isn't the most accurate way of measuring the volume. The most accurate way is to use a syringe. This is how it looks like and uh, make sure you draw these lines to show that the volume can be measured using these readings. Question 2. A student investigated the temperature change when magnesium ribbon reacts with dilute sulfuric acid. Five experiments were done. Experiment 1. Using a measuring cylinder, 20 cm cube of dilute sulfuric acid were poured into a boiling tube. A thermometer was used to measure the initial temperature of the acid. A 1 cm length magnesium ribbon was added to the acid in the boiling tube. The acid and magnesium ribbon in the boiling tube were stirred continuously using a thermometer. The highest temperature reached by the mixture was measured. The boiling tube was rinsed out with distilled water. Experiment 2. Experiment 1 was repeated using a 2 cm length of magnesium ribbon instead of the 1 cm length. Okay, so at first they used 1 cm, then for the second experiment they used 2 cm, then for third they used 3 cm, then 5 cm, then 6 cm. Part A. Use the information in the description of the experiments and the thermometer diagrams to complete the table. Length of magnesium ribbon. They were 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. Let's write that down first. Okay, then it's simple. You just have to read the readings 
23. The initial temperatures are the same. Okay, the highest temperature of acid, 24, 26, 29, 36, 40. Temperature increased. Just calculate how much it has increased. 1, 3, 6, 13, 17. Part B. In which experiment 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 was the temperature increase the largest? Well, just choose the number with the highest temperature increase. It's over here, 17. So it's experiment 5. Part C. Add a suitable scale to the y-axis and plot the results from experiments 1 to 5 on the grid. Draw a smooth line, making sure that your line passes through 0, 0. The scale of x-axis is already here, so we have to scale the y-axis. While well, y-axis is temperature increase, let's see the range of temperature increase that we need to record. They are from 1 to 17. Since we have four big boxes here, let's set one big box as 5. So it's from 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. Then all you need to do is just plot the graph. Okay, here's the graph. It looks pretty smooth and it passes through 0, 0 as well. So it's done. Part D. Explain why the graph must pass through 0, 0. This is because when the length of magnesium ribbon is 0, there should be also 0 temperature increase as there is no reaction when there is no magnesium. This is a bit of a common sense question. Part E. From your graph, did you use the temperature increase if experiment 1 is repeated using a 4 cm length of magnesium ribbon? Show clearly on the grid how you worked out your answer. You'd have noticed that we didn't plot anything for 4 cm, so let's see where it meets our graph. First, draw a straight vertical line until it touches the graph. Then draw a horizontal line to the y-axis to read its point. Alright, it's 9. So the temperature increase will be 9. Don't forget to put a unit, it's easy to forget. And since they said show it on the grid, don't erase these lines, they're gonna mark these lines. Part F. Why would carrying out the experiment in a polystyrene cup rather than a boiling tube improve the accuracy of the result? That is because while polystyrene is famous for being a good insulator, so there will be less heat lost to the surroundings by radiation and we'll be able to get more accurate readings. Sketch on the grid the graph you'd expect if the experiment was repeated using a polystyrene cup instead of a boiling tube. Since polystyrene can retain heat better, there will be higher increase in temperature. This is the important point that you should show. And also, your graph needs to start at 0, 0 as well because the same reason, there is obviously no reaction when there is no magnesium. So it will look like this. Your new graph should be above the old graph because the temperature increase will be higher. And yeah, it starts from 0, 0. It doesn't have to look exactly like this, but you know, just somewhere above this graph. Part G. The volume of dilute sulfuric acid could be measured with a 20 cm cube pipette. State one advantage of using a pipette rather than a measuring cylinder. Well, this is the apparatus that is known to be the most accurate, so it will be more accurate. State one disadvantage of using a pipette rather than a measuring cylinder. Okay, I'm not sure if you guys have used this before. Well, I've used it when I was doing my A-level and they take super long to use. For measuring cylinder, you just have to pour it, just check the reading, it's done. But for this, guys, they're pretty difficult to use. So it's because it's slower. Question 3. Two solids, solid L and solid M, were analyzed. Solid L was chromium 3 chloride. Tests were done on each solid. Tests on solid L. Complete the expected observations. Solid L was dissolved in distilled water to produce solution L. 
Solution L was divided into four portions in three test tubes and a boiling tube. Part A. To the first portion of solution L in the boiling tube, about 1 cm depth of dilute hydrochloric acid was added. The boiling tube was warmed gently. A strip of filter paper was dipped in acidified potassium manganate 7 solution and held at the mouth of the boiling tube. Solution L contains chromium 3 chloride dissolved in distilled water and acidified potassium manganate 7 is used to test the presence of a reducing agent. In the presence of a reducing agent, this will turn from purple to colorless. So we are required to find out whether adding chromium 3 chloride with dilute hydrochloric acid and heating it will produce a reducing agent. Well, chromium-3 is a metal and this is an acid and if you add metal with an acid, you get salt. In this case, it will be chromium hydroxide and hydrogen. But none of these are reducing agents, so nothing's gonna happen. It's just gonna stay the same in purple. Part B. To the second portion of solution L, aqueous sodium hydroxide was added slowly until it was in excess and no further changes were seen. Well, if you add chromium-3 with aqueous sodium hydroxide, you know the results. It's one of the tests for aqueous cations. Green precipitate will be formed, and since it's soluble in excess, green solution will be left. Part C. To the third portion of solution L, aqueous ammonia was added slowly until it was in excess and no further changes were seen. Again, with chromium-3 plus ions, if you add aqueous ammonia, we've learned that gray-green precipitate will be formed, but this time, it will not be soluble in excess, so there will be no change, even if it's added in excess. Part D. To the fourth portion of solution L, about 1 cm depth of dilute nitric acid was added followed by about 1 cm depth of aqua silver nitrate. This time, it's not related to chromium-3 ion, but instead it's related to chloride ions. So chloride ion is a halide, and this adding nitric acid and silver nitrate this is a famous test to test for the presence of halides, and in the presence of chloride, white precipitate will be formed. So the answer is, white precipitate is formed. Tests on solid M. Tests were done, and the following observations were made. Flame test. Yellow flame seen. Okay, flame test is quite straightforward. If it's yellow, it means that sodium is present. Then, test 2. About 10 cm cube of dilute nitric acid was added to solid M. Any gas produced was tested. There was effervescence and lime water turned milky. This means that CO2 was produced. And then anion, which produces carbon dioxide when added with a little bit of acid, is carbonate ion. So we can know that this has carbonate ions. Test 3. About 1 cm depth of aqueous barium nitrate was added to the solution formed by adding dilute nitric acid to solid M in test 2. So they added barium nitrate after adding nitric acid, and this is the test to test for the presence of sulfate ions, but there was no change, which means that sulfate ions are not present. While well, we have our answer, Na plus ions are present, and CO3-2 ions are also present, you can just write these ions as your answer. Or you can just write that it's a sodium carbonate. Question 4. Many window cleaning products contain aqueous ammonia. Aqueous ammonia is an alkali that reacts with dilute acids. Plan an investigation to find which of two window cleaning products contains the most concentrated aqueous ammonia, including your plan. They've talked about these acids, so obviously you have to include some procedures related to adding the acids. Anyway, the method you'll use, how your results will be used to determine which window cleaning product contains the most concentrated aqueous ammonia. 
You're provided with an accurate solution of the two window cleaning products, dilute hydrochloric acid of known concentrations, and common laboratory apparatus. This is a six mark question, but don't just write six points. You may lose one point because that point was somehow not in the mark scheme for your paper. So always write like eight or nine if possible to guarantee a full mark. So first, think about how your investigation will go. You're adding an acid and a base, which means that there will be titration. And for titration, you know that you need an indicator. And yeah, basically, you're just going to have your base in a beaker and hydrochloric acid from the burette. Drop it until you see a color change and measure the amount of hydrochloric acid you use to see a color change. And whatever that took the most amount of hydrochloric acid is the most concentrated one. I hope you guys are familiar with the concept of titration and the indicator changing its color. I'll go through the steps one by one. First, let's prepare this beaker with the cleaning product, which is ammonia. So we're going with the method first. Put each cleaner in two different beakers and add hydrochloric acid from a burette. Don't forget to add an indicator. So you're gonna add this acid until the indicator changes color. You can either use phenolphthalein or methyl orange. The independent variable is the type of the window cleaning product and we've already mentioned to use separate beakers and test them separately, so that's done. Then for the variables that need to be kept constant, well you have to add equal volumes of each cleaner to the beaker. So for example, you can add 50 cm cube of cleaner product A and 50 cm cube of product B. And of course, you have to measure it, so it's good to state how you're going to measure it. Maybe you can use a pipette or a measuring cylinder, and this will give you one more mark. Now it's time to talk about the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is the volume of hydrochloric acid added. And we can just find it out by reading from the burette how much it has been used. Then you can record the volume of acid added. Finally, a conclusion, it needs to be related to the reading that we found. While well, the product that used bigger volume of acid is more concentrated. This is because it means that the product required more volume of acid to be neutralized and its indicator to change its color, which is all because it's more concentrated than the other one. That's it for this paper. If this video helped you, please like and leave a comment because that's what keeps me going. Subscribe if you haven't yet. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and God bless you guys. Bye.